chapter 10, blindness and low vision. Uh, it was a little hard to uh, teach this one because of the small amount of students that are involved. There's very really not research. One of the things that is a challenge here is just like in deaf, and that is there's uh, 150 years of culture behind it where people, uh, you know, are still a strong pull to teach Braille and stick with traditional ways, uh, just like in the deaf where it was about sign language instead of the new technology. So there's some, some challenges here. Uh, you could teach your entire career and not have somebody that has a, a visual impairment like this, but it creates some awareness that should really help you in other areas. So chapter 10, uh, blind and low vision. Chapter 10, Blindness and Low Vision. Starts again with the focus questions, which I've brought onto the web page for you. And this uh, initial part is from the featured teacher in Ohio who works with blind kids. And it's always very interesting, their, their take on things. And I think it's a great idea that Dr. Heward here has uh, sought out these people to put at the beginning of each chapter that specialize in these low instance disabilities. And she has a good piece in here. Uh, the introduction is interesting here, and that is about this bright college-bound student. When asked to uh, put a, a banana's put in her hands, she has no idea what it is. And that's uh, the emphasis here. What the point they're making is how important the vision is uh, to uh, you know maneuver your world and experience the world. She wasn't able to hear, touch, smell, taste it. And it's down here, vision plays critical in learning in the classroom. So that, that's the emphasis of this. Normally, students are routinely expected to exercise several important visual skills. They must be able to focus on different objects, shift their vision from uh, near to far as needed, must have hand good hand-eye coordination, maintain visual uh, concentration, discriminate among letters, all those things that vision is a huge part, much bigger than we think. So then let me flip back here to the definitions. Uh, this is just, she has a, a support here, some things to see. She's low vision, she's not blind. But this is a legal definition based on visual acuity and field of vision. So here's number one of your inputs, is I would like you to make a, a definition of each of those. What is visual acuity? What is field of vision? Because they're different. So a person whose physical visual acuity is 2200 or less after the best possible correction with glasses or contact lenses is considered legally blind. After. After correction. A person whose visual acuity is 2070 in the, in the uh, better eye. So 2070 and better eye correction is considered partially sighted. So they separate them here. Let's go back to the textbook and talk about this. Um, unlike other disabilities covered by IDA, uh, visual impairment has both legal and educational definitions, two separate ones that, that function separately. So uh, uh, statutory definition of blindness is based on visual acuity and field of vision. Uh, so here's visual acuity, the ability to distinguish from forms and discriminate among details is most often measured uh, um, reading letters, numbers, and this, and the Snell and I chart. So let's, uh, let's go to this and see what that is. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Yeah. So it looks like this, these things here, and we've all seen them. So let's just go here and see what this is. And I want to look at the images instead of shopping for them. And so I see this here. And this is what it looks like. And we're just going to clip this. I'm going to bring this right in. This is my Jing, it's called. And I'm going to just clip this image. And that's this one. I'm going to capture it. And then I'm just going to copy it. I'm going to come in here. and paste it in one of these here for you. I'm going to make a new slide and slide it down here so that you have it. Like 
this. And you've seen these. I'm sure. Where it tells you how far away this is and it gives you this. So this is the initial the Snell and I chart is the initial one. And of course it's accepted worldwide and I was a little boy in school and I can remember doing the I chart in the nurse's office uh, you know once a year in this same chart. But it just gives you an idea of what they can see and you start out and say, oh tell me read these letters on the bottom line for me. So it's just an initial um, screen for it. And that's what that Snell and I chart is. So that familiar phrase of 2020 does not, as some people think, mean perfect vision. It simply indicates that at a distance of 20 feet, the eye can see what a normal seeing person sees at that point, at that distance. As the bottom number increases, visual acuity decreases. Okay, so a person whose visual acuity is 20, 200 or less in the better eye with the use of corrective lenses. And that's important. It's not when you take the glasses off, the lenses off. It's considered legally blind, blind by whom? The federal government and Social Security Administration makes that decision. Okay, and I'll tell you in a little bit why that's important. But um, I'm going to come back here and say that I want you to write this next to here. This is our number two by Fed, the federal government. Okay, they decide that, not you. Okay, and then if uh, Jane has a 2200 vision while wearing her glasses, she needs to stand at a distance of 20 feet to see what normally p people see at 200. Okay, so that there's a bit for you right now to take forward out of this class. If nothing else, there's something new for you. 2200 uh, means that somebody can see at uh, 20 feet what you can see at 200. And hence, that's where this comes back into play that... Uh, somebody could stand and see this, you know, at uh, 200 feet, and they, you would have to be within 20 feet to see that if you were legally blind as to the federal government. Jane Musk gets much closer than normal to see things clearly. She will likely find it difficult to use her vision in everyday situations. And so that's the key. <coughs> <coughs> that is the key. Um, for legally blind, that um, you won't be able to use it. This was number two. You won't be able to use it um, to learn. Okay. So, but many children with 2200 or even 2400 visual acuity succeed in um, the classroom with special help. Some students' visual acuity is so poor they cannot do see the details at any distance even while wearing their glasses. Individual with visual acuity no better than 2070 and, and uh, the better eye after correction is considered partially sighted. And that uh, that's what this is. 2070 is better in the better eye after correction is considered partially sighted for legal purposes. Okay, and legal purposes is, again is the feds. Okay. Person also considered legally blind if his field of vision is extremely restricted. When gazing straight ahead, a normal eye uh, can see objects within a range of approximately <coughs> 160 to 170 degrees. I always thought that's uh, when I played basketball. I I always felt I had that de uh, visual perception from side to side. I always thought mine was greater than that. And you kind of know how that is, right? But this would be that visual perception if I was standing here looking uh, 180 degrees that would mean I could see from here to here and they're saying actually normal person can see from about 160 to 170 a little bit less and I felt that I had this uh, visional uh, that I could see things actually I could sense them and see them behind me at least I told myself that nobody else said that but I always thought I did so that's what this is this field of vision it's normal is 160 to 170 person whose vision is restricted to an area of 20 or less considered legally blind. So 20 or less, if I'm standing here, 20 degrees or less would be pretty narrow in front of me. That would be considered legally blind. Some people with tunnel vision 
describe their perception of viewing the world through a narrow tube. They may have good central vision, but poor per, uh, peripheral vision at the outer ranges of the visual field. Conversely, an eye condition makes it possible for people to see things clearly at the center of the visual field, lowly relative peripheral vision. Because a person's field is, it deteriorates gradually over a period of years without notice, thorough visual examination should always include measure of visual field. And it says 10-1 shows what a person might see with normal vision. Okay, here, this is important why I said this uh, comes to this. Children who are legally blind are eligible to receive a wide variety of educational services, materials, and benefits from government agencies, the feds. What are those things? If you're considered legally blind, you're, a, you're a free uh, talking books and playback devices from the Library of Congress and their schools may be able to buy books and educational materials from the American Printing House for the Blind. The federal government allots states and local school districts a certain financial allowance each legally blind student. A person who is legally blind is also entitled to vocational training. Free U.S. mail, mail service, and income tax exemption. Okay, so if you're considered legally blind, you get free vocational training, not college training, not college of your choice, vocational training, free. And then free mail means you can mail stuff free. And income tax exemption means you don't pay any income tax. You add to that number of people not paying. So that's, uh, that's why that's important. That's why I came back here and said the feds will tell you who is legally blind. And because why they're going to tell you is they're going to decide what you get from it, who gets this free stuff. So I worked with several people who that was their strife. That was their desire. That was their goal was to be considered legally blind so they could kick into this other thing. Of course, you're eligible for SSI, uh, a number of other payments also. One in particular, and it was a young man that I worked with in, uh, uh, in the job program I ran, who that was his thing. He was just so distraught because he couldn't get over that hump to be considered legally blind. And so that's why that was important. So what are the educational definitions of this? Well, uh, in, in visual impairment in the ID Act has this, it, it's including blindness means an impairment of vision that even with correction adversely affects the child's educational performance. And we've had that uh, on every one we've talked about. It has to affect their educational performance. Can be both partial sight and blindness. So even if you're not legally blind or any of that stuff, it can still, that sighted problems with sight can still impact learning, have a, an impact on learning. Okay, so students display a wide range of visual abilities. So here, this is interesting too, that uh, like totally blind receives no useful information from the sense of vision. That would be, and this is only idea now. Then functionally blind learns primarily through the auditory and tactile senses. And then low vision uses vision as a primary means of learning, but may supplement by using tactile and auditory things. So functionally, it means they use it some. Okay, that's IDEA's uh, definition. Let's go back to the textbook, and here it describes that. Then let's just, age of onset is interesting. Let me put this in here. I'm gonna add this also. This will uh, push you a little bit. But this is not, when I bring this in, this is not going to come into your notes. So I'm going to ask you to take your note outline, go find this uh, Sneller um, chart, and insert it into your notes. So I see a space in your notes that has this one or one like it in there to let me know that you know how to do this and you know what this is. And then I want you to make sure it's labeled, because this one isn't, is the Snellen uh, eye chart. This is number three. So when I'm flipping through your notes, I see, should see an image inserted into it that's a Snellen eye chart. So age of onset, and it has really interesting things here. Uh, about it, how important it is that for the teacher to know because there's two uh, things here, uh, uh, 
like other disabilities, visual impairment can be congenital or advent adventitious. And I'm going to ask you to bring those in here. This is number four. Uh, two, congenital. And adventitious. What are the definitions of those two? And then uh, number five is here is what why is this important? Why important is this? And the reason it's important is right here, and that is that it's better for the teacher to know, like for example, if they were blind since birth, they'll have a different perception of the world than a child who's lost his vision at age 12. Because the first child has a background of learning through hearing, touching, and other visual things, so you don't have to teach that. Where somebody that's had vision until age 12, you're going to have to teach them. They'll have to be taught how to experience the, the world without their eyes. And rarely is it a sudden at 12 it disappears, but what happens is it's uh, congenital, uh, I mean, in this adventitious thing that's acquired is it's a slow uh, pull, it's a slow descent of losing it. So that's age of onset. So what about these characteristics? Okay, here's goes back to this banana. Uh, Maria had uh, Maria had eaten bananas many times. She could spell the word banana, read that word, but she couldn't explain the best climate for growing bananas because she'd ever held the banana. Banana, she was able to do this. So vision enables them to organize those connections. That's what this is about. So let's look at those characteristics. Makes it difficult to see connections between experiences. And abstract concepts, analogies, idiomatic and expressions can be difficult. And that's what this was about here. Sighted children with other disabilities are considerably constantly learning from their experiences, interactions with their environment. As they move out, sense of sight provides steady stream of detailed information about their environment. Okay, so you don't have to give it to them. They're taking it in themselves. They're part of the part of the other children with normal sight produce great stores of useful knowledge from everyday experiences. Visual impairments, however, preclude most uh, such incidental learning. So Farrell described what two children, and one with normal vision and one with others, uh, experience in their daily lives. And he goes through this. is very interesting. Um, this morning stuff and so it's very interesting and they just have a trouble making those connections so what about social adjustment children with visual impairments interact less and are often delayed in social skills why because so often that comes into our eyes to read social connections those nonverbals many persons who have lost their sight report that the biggest difficulty socially is dealing with the attitudes and behavior of those around them What's this thing? Mo uh, development and mobility. Blindness or severe visual impairments often leads to delays or deficits in motor development. Vision plays four important functions in the acquisition of motor skills. Okay. Is number six. So I'm going to ask you to bring these in right here. Slide this down. And these things right here. This acquisition, motivation, spatial awareness, protection, and feedback. You bring those in here, how, what, how this affects or why. No, just that they are motor development things. Okay. Child's efforts to grasp objects, especially those who are just out of reach, strengthen muscles, improve coordination. So it's a huge deal. When sitting up and returning and turning her head from side to side, then it's, she's lying on the floor. Precision provides critical information on the distance of objects and direction of movement. I think of uh, I think of how my kids learn to catch the baseball and stuff without a lot of instruction from me at all. That they start to judge the distance and speed, and it's not automatic. It takes time, of course. Okay. Even limited vision can have a negative effects on motor development. Children with low division have poor motor skills and children with are sighted. Okay. So let's jump to the social adjustments interactions. Compared to typically sighted children, children with visual impairments play and interact less during free time. They're often delayed in the development of social skills. 
Though many adolescents with visual impa uh, impairments have best friends, many also struggle with social isolation, must work harder than their sighted peers to make friends. Interact less. The biggest difficulty socially is dealing with the attitudes and behaviors of those around them. And they make it sound, uh, the, the uh, connotation here is that it's bad, but it's often in uh, people's inability to connect to them, just like here. It's in limited involvement. Okay. Several factors include limited social involvement. Many cannot benefit from peers or adult role models because there's very few around. Then the inability to see and respond to social signals of others reduce those opportunities. Some individuals with visual impairments engage in repetitive body movements or other behaviors which places them at a great social disadvantage. And this is why they have a hard time making friends. Other kids aren't drawn to somebody that has these repetitive body motions. Uh, in fact, it kind of scares other kids. Many of the biggest difficulty is dealing with attitudes of uh, behavioral sighted people. And I'm saying sighted kids. I uh, resent this constant implication that we're a bunch of uh, bigots here and stuff. That uh, I, I think it's a very normal thing that you're, uh, you, other kids would struggle with making friends with, like, with, with kids that are visually impaired. Normal. And now, uh, of course, the other thing is they look different. If they're completely blind, they have a different look to them. But this textbook likes to make that implication here. Okay. Although not uh, always, not usually harmful, stereotypical behavior can place a person with visual impairments at great social disadvantage because these actions are conspicuous and may call negative attention to the person. It is not known why many children with visual impairments engage in stereotypical behaviors though the uh, vestibular stimulation produced by the behaviors is a suspected source. That rocking can be comforting, that's why. However, behavioral interventions such as self-monitoring and differential reinforcements can help with that. So that, that does present some challenges there, um, is that stereotypical behavior. And that is kids with intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, speech things, all those things. Even though it makes us look like a bunch of uh, discriminating uh, heathens, it ultimately uh, makes these kids different. And so to continually lament uh, the other kids for not being friends with these kids to me is always a very misguided, but I'm in the minority of this on that attitude that most people in the field would say that uh, it's because we are you know, a bunch of uh, discriminating pigs in some way. And so, like I say, I, I kind of resent that constant implication. So, about prevalence, what are the prevalence of this? Well, the American Foundation of the Blind estimates that more than 25 million people in the United States are living with a vision loss, a visual perception requiring special ed and low incidence disabilities. Children with visual impairments constitute a very small percentage of school age population, fewer than two in a thousand children. Okay. So it makes it really hard to do good research, those things, because it's a very low incidence disability. And you could very easily teach your entire career and not have somebody in your class that is legally blind. Because it's two in a thousand. Even when viewed as a percentage of the population of students who receive special ed services, the prevalence of visual impairments is very small. Only about 1 in 200 to 250 of school-aged children with IEPs are served in this category. During the 9-10 school year, 25,806 to 21 was all that was served under this category in the United States. Here's the big kicker though. Many students with visual impairments have one or more additional disabilities served and counted under other disability categories such as deaf, blind, and multiple disabilities. Thus, the number of students with visual impairments is larger than the data reported by IDA. And the American Printing House has this number. <coughs> I know this in Aberdeen. There still exists a school that is called School for the Blind. But with that, they will not accept somebody that has their, their disability, their primary disability as blind. 
that almost exclusively everybody there has much, much more severe disabilities, one of which is blindness. Many of those kids are mental, have intellectual disabilities uh, and all kinds of health impairments and stuff, so they're very severely disabled kids, but it's still called School for the Blind, even though they really won't accept kids in this here discussion. That are, that's their primary and really their only disability. So let's go back here to uh, this. With visual impairments, have also have another disability. That's, uh, and then we go into how we see optical system, a muscular system, and nervous system. Three things. Um, and then it takes you through this. And this really is laid out here better on this page. Okay. I'm sure you remember these lessons about how light comes in and it flips like this. And here's this optical nerve. Come back here. It uh, talks about these. Um, this binocular vision. I'm going to beef this up just a little bit. This ocular mobility, um, binocular vision, accommodation. The eye's nervous system converts light energy into electrical impulses and transmits the information to the brain or to process individual images. The retina consists of millions of light uh, receptors called cones and rods. I think that's on the test. You have to have that on the test, I think, about which one that is. Cones enable detection of color, detail necessary or tasks such as reading. And they're located in the center of the rods are responsible for peripheral vision, de uh, detection, and movement, those things. So let me... I'm going to make this, uh, I forget what this is, number seven here. I would like this to be number seven here. I hear what I mean. We do that. Let me take you back to um, again how we see, and I don't. I don't know if I should have this uh, come in here. Also, let me have a look at it. Let me make this number seven: uh, uh, ocular mobility, a definition, a binocular uh, vision, and then accommodation in this terms, not accommodation overall, but as it means here. Because you got this, right, on um, yeah, nearsighted and farsightedness. And there again, that's another nice one for you to take with you. Is uh, myopia is nearsighted and hyperopia is farsightedness. And then this won't be number seven, this will be number seven here. And that is these three words right here on page 2350. And then this will be number eight here. Let me just give you a quick look at what we can do with those for you. What I'm going to do is this, just put them in order like this for you. Define each of those. Okay. There you have those. That's number eight here. There's how you see. Cones and rods. <coughs> so what are some of the causes of these visual impairments? Well, damage or disturbance to any part of the eye, optical, muscular, or nervous system can result in impaired vision. Cause of visual impairments are grouped into three broad categories. A refractive error, structural impairment, or uh, cortical visual impairments. So first of all, refractive error is this, as we see here, is this uh, myopia or hypertonia, hy hy hyperopia, okay, and there's those. 
and structural are cataract, glaucoma. Control the eyes are this. So you bring all those in. And then cor uh, cortical visual impairments. First to reduce functioning due to known suspected damage or malfunction of parts. Causes of this oxygen at birth, head injury. And so uh, this will be number nine where you bring in those things here. Let's see. Right here on page 352. And table 10.1 summarizes these. And the reason that's important to kind of have a feeling for these is so that you kind of know what goes with that. Okay, for example, uh, here's one we're familiar with a cataract. And this topic here is educational implications. Avoid glare of any kind, light sources. So as a teacher, you'd like to know some of that. Here's a real new trendy one is the uh, diabetic uh, retinopathy. Good lighting and contrast. Glaucoma. My father has glaucoma. My wife and I are opposite here. I have this. Um, I can, or the other way. I have uh, the far, the near side thing. I can see up close. If I need to read something small, I take my glasses off. She's the other way. She needs to see something farther away. She takes the glasses off, but she can't read a thing. She can't read her phone. She has a hundred pairs of reading glasses around. You've heard of this macular degeneration? Okay. So it does a nice job here of going through those. Okay. They look the same there, don't they? Okay, so I'm going to take one of these out of here. There. Now the educational approaches. Here's one of their barriers, I think, just like deaf. I just read this whole thing. Educators have developed numerous specializing teaching methods and curriculum materials in an effort to overcome obstacles of learning presented to blindness, low vision. Recent advances in technology have greatly increased access to the general curriculum. Nap is academic success for students with visual impairment. As one high school student who is blind remarked, by taking advantage of the technology around me, I am able to have an educational equal to my sighted peers. However, the education of students with visual impairments in a field with rich history of more than 150 years. So just like the deaf, there's a culture that's been established that's really hard to break. In other words, there's a lot of advocates still saying they need to learn to read Braille and stuff and not associate as much with the technology. So this is a barrier as well as a blessing, this 150 years. You don't see that with uh, intellectual disabilities or learning disabilities or uh, communication disorders, a number of these other things. You don't have to fight the history of it. Here you do, this and deaf. So what are these special adaptions that are for people that are blind? Well, Braille, of course, in the book does a nice job of trying to explain Braille. Well, this is the history of it, and that's a long way back to 1784. Okay, I was looking at this, trying to figure out um, how this uh, all works out here. But very interesting, like number one is one, and two is two and three. But when you get to four, it's just two dots this way, like this. And the one on the bottom tells them it's a number. 
So very interesting system. And if you've ever seen people read Braille, they can read as fast, fast that way as you and I can by cited words. Okay, and here it talks about a number of technologies uh, involved with it. Braille is a primary means of literacy for people who are blind. And I, I say I think that's fast quickly fading. Young people are you being taught more of the technology, the screen readers and stuff on our iPads, and I think that will be reduced. It's a tactile system of reading and writing composed of raised dots. Uh, there's all kinds of tactile aids and manipulatives here. And so I want you to make uh, one uh, sentence about this. Let's make this number 8. All right, let's see, what, where were we? 9, 10. Number 10, you write some things about tactile aids and manipulatives there. It comes here from page uh, 356. There's a whole bunch of them there. And you're just going to list some of them. You don't need to tell a lot about them. Then technology ages for reading print is the Kurzweil 1000, and that's a very interesting one also. Magnify screen images, speech recognition software, software that converts text files to synthesize speech, all these things. And that's why I think Braille will soon be way underemphasized. And this is the part that's being uh, challenged by the 150 years is people... Uh, this culture, this blind culture, hanging on to the past, and that's Braille. Okay, computer access. And special adaptions. 75 to 80 percent of school age children enrolled in educational programs for visually impaired have some potential useful vision. Okay, so that, that changes this a little bit. 75%, 80% of the school age who, who are IEPs for this have some useful vision. So that takes you down to the completely blind to a teeny, teeny little amount. Teeny, teeny little few. Okay, so they're generally learned to read print. Functional vision and visual efficiency are related terms. Okay. Following skills. Functional vision teaches the useful use of remaining, and there's others that's functional. And what I would like you to do here is what are these others? The following skills here, and so this is on page 358, and so this is number 11, just a quick uh, one liner about each of these, how they fit into this visual efficiency here. Okay. Again, they do a nice job here of talking about how to teach the scheduling and stuff like that. Then these optical devices. Let's go over to this. Glasses and contact lenses, handheld telescopes and magnifiers, closed circuit televisions, augmented reality systems. Uh, and then some uh, approaches for magnification, uh, for reading print, large print, all those things that you're probably aware of come into play here. Here's the thing of reading print. And you and I are like this, and this is what I like about technology. I use this all the time, is I up the font so I can see it, so I can read it easier. This is 10 point I'm reading now, and I'm not sure that's exactly right because I've enlarged it up here with this thing. But... Um, but how you can increase that now. And a lot of elderly people like me like that on technology. Then this classroom adaption, I want you to do that also. This is um, number 12. And I've highlighted these here for you. Uh, number 12 on page 360. Proper lighting with adjustable uh, tops, writing paper, colored paper that can be difficult, uh, chairs with wheels on that they can move. So I got one, two, three, four, five things to bring in here with some possible classroom adaptions on page 360. And here's again an advantage of large print materials. All right. An expanded core curriculum. And this is huge, this O&M. Orientation and mobility, they're different, but they go together. And they're not the same thing. And that is this. I want you to uh, bring that in here, number 13, the definition of, of each of those. 
of O and M, and it's quite obvious when you look at it, is knowing where you are. Orientation is know where you are, and of course, mobility involves moving there safely. You know, orientation not only uh, whereabouts, but where things are. You know, the definition of confusion: you move the furniture on the blind person because they memorize where things are. So we could know where things are, but can't get there safely. And that's those the different things there. AP is virtually all children with significant visual impairments have goals for orientation and mobility. We looked at the other, uh, looked at the uh, related services when we studied the IEP. The orientation mobility on that page didn't mean anything to you unless you were in this tiny, tiny minutia of students that called uh, visually impaired or blind. And so a lot of your IEPs, a lot of your training, a lot of your time spent during the day is on orientation mobility. And the goals may be that more than academic because it's a huge part how independent they can li live is that. So with that, we talk about cane skills, guide dogs, sighted guides, electronic travel. And I'm going to make this number 14. And that is just one line about each of these things, including listening skills. Okay, there's your cane skills. This is using vo vision aids. Um, this is interesting too, disagreement over which, if any mobility device is most suitable for young children. And then here's the thing about guide dogs. You can put some information about guide dogs, sighted guides, electronic travel aids, and listening skills. So you put some information of each of those in. And then we go to functional life skills, and here they are. Such as um, cooking, personal hygiene, grooming, shopping, financial management, transportation, recreational activities. Um, and just think of this. One of the huge things is you learn that uh, you teach kids that are uh, visually impaired how to access the bus system. Because quite obviously, even in South Dakota, they're not going to what? Drive. So that's a list of things that you would work on in their school day. That they would have a whole different perception of hygiene. For example, my kids, uh, my middle schoolers now, uh, mine were both in middle school, are very, very aware of fashion and hygiene and haircuts and shaving and smelling good don't really have to teach it you have to you have to <laughs> modify it sometimes but they pick up a lot of that from watching the others and what about the placements and again this takes you through this um, 88 percent in public schools now and once above that a lot of those have multiple disabilities 62% of general classroom, and remember that doesn't that just simply means by the number of minutes they're away from regular kids that they may not be limited by their disability, but how much away they're how much they're away from their peers working on orientation mobility issues. So they may have the ability to be in the regular classroom, but they're out because they're working on their other goals. Some in separate classrooms, special day schools, residential schools like uh, school for the blind. I say it's a teeny amount because they want them to have these other disabilities. And the reason this is such a small amount because it's a battle with the 150 years <coughs> coming with that there. Okay. And this is about the inclusive uh, teacher, inclusive classroom itinerant teacher, what they do. Then you want to read this because there's some questions on the test about this. And it takes you through these residential schools. And all the different placement options for it. Okay. So that's chapter 10, blindness and low vision.